father says to his son, son, did you not promise me that you would study harder this semester? Well, dad, yes, I did. Uh, did I not promise you that if your grades didn't come up, I would take away your car? Yes, dad, that's true as well. Well, son, what do you have to say for yourself? Well, dad, the way I see it, since I didn't keep my word to you, then I'm not going to hold you to your word either. How often have you heard statements like the following? I solemnly swear, or with God is my witness, or if I'm lying, I'm dying. Why is it so hard to find people today who will simply stand by their word? Now, there is one group of people today who you should be able to trust to keep their word. Uh, although, sadly, I have to admit, even with this group, it's not always the case. Uh, there's one group of people whom, when they tell you something, you should be able to count on it. Jesus expects his followers to tell the truth and stand by their word. That's because God takes the truth seriously. If you don't believe it, ask Ananias and Sapphira. Oh, wait, you can't because they're dead. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira were a couple who were part of that very first church in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. Their story is found in Acts chapter 5. At the time, the early church was having a fundraising drive to help the needy in the community. And people were selling pieces of property and donating the proceeds to the church. When Ananias and Sapphira saw all the attention that this was generating, they decided to get on the act themselves. So they sold a piece of land but they donated only a portion of the proceeds. However, when they came to present their gift, they acted as if they were donating all the profits from the sale. And as a result, God struck them both dead right there in the church service. Wouldn't that get some people's attention? As the apostle Paul warned them as this was unfolding, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie in the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you've conceived this deed in your heart? You've not lied to men, but to God. Now, just to be clear, their sin was not in keeping back part of the portion of the sale. Their sin was in lying about it. So what does that story tell you about how seriously God takes telling the truth? Jesus addressed this topic in his Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 5 verses 33 through 37. First, Jesus paraphrased a command on truthfulness that's found throughout the Old Testament. According to Matthew 5 33, he said, again, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. Now, in contrast to what we have seen so far in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus did not quote directly from a particular Old Testament law in this instance. Instead, he referred to a theme that's found in several places throughout the Bible. Interestingly, uh, Jesus didn't appear to be drawing upon the first or the part of the Ten Commandments most people would expect, Exodus 20, 16, which says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Instead, he appears to be referring to the commandment expressed in Exodus 20, verse 7, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Uh, some of the passages that Jesus seems to have had in mind include passages like Leviticus 19.12, which says, You shall not swear falsely in my name, so as to profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Or Numbers 30, verse 2, where God's people were told, If a man makes a vow to the Lord, or takes an oath to bind himself with a binding obligation, he shall not violate his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. Many times when the ancients would make a vow, they would seal that vow by appealing to God's name. Now, any promise is a serious matter, but especially one that invokes God. That's because God always keeps his word, and he expects his people to keep their word as well. In Deuteronomy 7, verse 9, Moses told God's people, Know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousandth, thousandth generation with those who love him and keep his commandments. If God gives you his word, then you never have to wonder if he's going to follow through. And if we're to be his people, we should reflect his character 
by keeping our word too. God especially expects us to be truthful in promises we've made to him. Maybe you've heard the story about a pastor that was traveling on an airplane when it encountered some severe turbulence. And for several minutes, the plane was tossed up and down and side to side, and a lot of the passengers were getting uh, visibly unsettled. The pastor even heard a businessman sitting across the aisle from him praying, Dear God, get this plane on the ground safely, and I'll give you half of everything I own. Well, sure enough, the skies calmed, the plane continued its journey, and it arrived safely at its destination. And as the passengers were deplaning, the uh, pastor leaned over to the businessman and said, you know, I couldn't help but overhear your prayer earlier. I just wanted to let you know I'm a pastor, and so if you need some help following through on that, I can make some recommendations. Well, the businessman laughed and he said, thanks, Reverend, but I've made a new deal with God, so I won't have to give him half of everything I own. The new deal is, if I ever get back on one of these things, he gets everything. Now, there really is no renegotiating with God. When we make a promise to him, he expects us to follow through. As Deuteronomy 23, 21 says, When you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay in paying it, for it would be a sin in you, and the Lord your God will surely require it of you. Or Ecclesiastes 5, 4, which says, When you make a vow to God, do not be late in paying it. For he takes no delight in fools. Pay what you owe. God takes the truth seriously, but human nature tends to twist the truth conveniently. According to the 1991 best-selling book, The Day America Told the Truth, 91% of those surveyed lie routinely about matters they consider trivial. 36% lie about important matters. 86% lie regularly to their parents. 75% lie to their friends. 73% lie to their siblings. And 69% even lie to their spouses. This propensity to bend the truth is not just a modern phenomenon. Jesus alluded to several loopholes that his contemporaries used to promise everything without actually accomplishing anything. In uh, Matthew 5, verses 34 through 36, Jesus says, but I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it's the throne of God, or by the earth, for it's the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you can't make one hair white or black. Now, in first century Judea, it was common for people to bolster their promises by invoking God or something connected to God. However, it was also common for people to try to frame those invocations in ways that actually were not as binding as they seemed. The problem was so bad, there was actually an entire section of Jewish law devoted to the discussion of which invocations were binding and which ones weren't. And Jesus referenced several of these common loopholes in his comments. For example, some would say that an oath made in the name of heaven was binding, while one invoking the earth was not. Some would argue that an oath made by Jerusalem was not binding, while making an oath through Jerusalem was. Now, let's be honest, these loopholes were simply semantic tricks aimed at allowing people to give the appearance of credibility without actually placing themselves under any obligation to follow through. Human beings naturally seek to hide the truth or manipulate the truth. This is part of our nature. To quote the film, A Few Good Men, some people believe you can't handle the truth. Consider the bizarre world of job recommendations. Virtually every job application or resume I've ever seen requires a person to list references. However, here's the dirty little secret for you. In today's society, employers are scared to death to give honest references because they're afraid they're going to be sued. Robert Thornton, a professor at Lehigh University, has actually developed a collection of what he calls virtually litigation-proof phrases called the Lexicon of Intentionally Ambiguous Recommendations, or L-I-A-R. For example, to describe an inept person, he would recommend saying, I enthusiastically recommend this candidate with no qualifications whatsoever. Hmm. To describe an ex-employee who had problems getting along with co-workers, I'm pleased to say that this candidate is a former colleague of mine. Uh, how about describing an unproductive candidate as, I can assure you that no person 
would be better for the job. Or to describe an applicant who's not worth consideration. I would urge you to waste no time in making this candidate an offer of employment. You see how that game works? The late columnist William Sapphire once wrote about politicians who were adept at manipulating the truth to their advantage. Sapphire described this phenomenon as the if by whiskey speech. The phrase refers to a politician, supposedly in Florida, who once was asked if he thought counties, uh, when counties were deciding whether or not to allow liquor sales, if which he was in favor of, whether he was in favor of wet counties or dry counties. And supposedly the politician's reply was, well, if by whiskey, you mean the water of life that cheers men's souls, that soothes out the tensions of the day, that gives general perspective to one's view of life, then put my name on the list of the fervent wets. But if by whiskey, you mean the devil's brew that rends families, destroys careers, and ruins one's ability to work, then count me in the ranks of the dries. Now, we can laugh at such examples because we all recognize in them the attempt to say something without actually saying anything. However, Jesus expects his disciples to take a higher ground when it comes to telling the truth. Jesus' disciples should uphold the truth sacrificially. Instead of playing word games to manipulate the truth, Jesus calls on his followers to let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. In fact, he says anything more than that is of evil or literally of the evil one. Now, Jesus doesn't condemn the taking of all oaths, only the appeal to something outside oneself for credibility. It's an important distinction. The Bible actually affirms oaths taken as a religious or civic duty. Oaths of this nature are simply affirmations that one's word is believable. According to Matthew 26, verses 63 through 64, Jesus himself took an oath at his own trial. The apostle Paul invoked oaths to bolster his testimony. For example, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 23, he says, But I call God as witness to my soul, that to spare you I did not come again to Corinth. Or in Galatians 1, 20, Now in what I am writing to you, I assure you that before God I am not lying. Even God's been known to bind himself by an oath before. As the writer of Hebrews 6, verses 13-17 through 17 tells us, For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you. And so, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath given as confirmation is an end of every dispute. In the same way, God, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose, interposed with an oath. However, that said, in everyday life, if your word is not enough without an oath, it'll never be enough even with an oath. Jesus' followers should guard their integrity in such a way that others can take their words at face value. Jesus' followers should stand by their word even when it costs them. We read those beautiful words in Psalm 15 verses 1-4 through four that talk about Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? In other words, who is able to approach a holy God? And here's the answer. He who walks with integrity and works righteousness and speaks truth in his heart. He does not slander with his tongue, nor does he take uh, uh, does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a reprobate is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord. He swears to his own hurt, and does not change. In other words, this is the kind of person whose integrity is so strong that even if it costs him, he's going to stand by his word. You ever made a promise that later something you know came up that uh, made that a costly promise to make, and you could have gotten out of it, but instead you decided, you know what, I'm going to stand by this. I said it. It may hurt, but I said it, so I'm going to do it. Augustine, the great theologian, once said, no one errs more safely than when one errs by too much loving the truth. Can people take you at your word? Or is your word so cheap that you have to invoke some outside help in order for others to take you seriously? Our world is starving for someone willing to tell the truth and to stick by it. How many people have taken the Lord's name in vain by taking on the name Christian only to betray it by their behavior? 
we as followers of Jesus need to do better. We hope you've enjoyed this study. If so, please give it a like and share it with your friends. In our next video, we're going to talk about revenge and why an eye for an eye is not a great guiding principle for personal relationships. <music>